Hi, I'm Jerry Rasco, and I've been working as a professional comic book artist since 2004. I've worked for many independent publishers, such as MC Studios, Beta 3, Arcana, and Counterpoint Comics. The videos I make here on YouTube are my way of sharing my experiences, tips, tricks, and my passion for comics. Whether you're a creator, a longtime fan, or someone new to comics, I hope you enjoy these videos. That said, let's get started. Hello! Um, welcome to another video. Um, so if you've been watching any of the recent videos I did where I, I redid a piece of art from 25 years ago, I did um, this piece here, this piece here. Um, one of the things that I noted in the comments as I was working through that is that uh, folks were asking me to do another video about comics, about the sequential pages of comics. So I am about to start on the next page of the project that I'm working on. And I wanted to kind of walk you through some of the process and explain, show you the script and kind of how I put it together and how I lay out the page and, and that kind of stuff. So first thing I'm going to do is show you what I do here is I take the script and I print it out. And so this is the page. These are the pages that came before and I just flip them over. And then this is the page I'm going to work on it. And this orange piece of paper from here down, there's another panel that comes after this. This is all redacted because I don't want to give away the spoiler of the page. So the last panel of the page, I will not be showing you guys. Um, but the first part I wanted to do is, is show you. So first I get the script. Um, it's, it's, uh, shared in a word document and I've read through the whole thing. And so then I go in and I print out just a couple pages that I'm going to be working on and I take it. And the way that it's written by, um, my, my creative partner, Terry Sala, he writes it. And so he kind of, he doesn't tell me very much about panels. So you can see here, this is all really, mostly some very basic dialogue. So the first character, in fact, I'm going to change that character, but there's a whole reason for that. Um, the first character says, you know, Hey, uh, the first guy up, you're the vibration guy. Yep. And the, that character says, yep. Uh, then this girl luminous, she says, okay, I'm going to light up. You've got to shake me to the point where I, I lose my concentration and, and my powers go off. So then she powers herself off the guy who has vibration. So then there's a direction he puts, because there's no dialogue. He puts his hands together like a two handed finger gun, maybe put some speed lines in a second panel around his fingers. And then she says like, I, I feel it, but it's, it's not enough. So he goes, okay, I'm going to go harder. So he's going to amp up the power and then boom, something happens. So what I do is I take this and I go, okay, how in my head do I picture this is terms of split up of, panels. So the first part, you pretty much whenever you have characters, unless they are close together, you're typically, I typically split up panels based on dialogue, kind of the way you would have a TV camera or movie camera go from actor to actor as they're conversing. Sometimes you want to have them in a two shot, meaning there's two characters together. So if they're walking down a hallway you want to show that hallway, you, you have them together. Um, if you if you want to focus on what they're saying, then you're only going to show that one character, that one actor, whatever, focus on them, and then the camera flips into the response. So in this case, um, there's, there's people, uh, the first panel, I'm going to have both of them. So the first guy is saying, hey, you're, you're up first, right? And, and the character goes, yep, that's me. Then I'm going to cut to the new character where she's explaining what she's going to do. Then she's, I'm going to have a panel with her powered up. That'll be probably one of the bigger um, anchor panels. I'll explain what that is. Then some more action. And then the last panel. So I always keep it over here on the side of my board uh, over on this side so that I can refer back to it if I, if I need to and make sure I'm doing the right thing. So an anchor panel, let me talk about that real quick. So, um, and I'm sorry, I'm looking, here we go. Here's my pencil. Um, so in a page, when you have action, dialogue, stuff going on, 
if you have everything exactly the same. So let's, I'll show you on this uh, piece of paper here. So let's say, um, and this is how they used to do um, pages back in the day. Let me see that. So they would do what they call a six panel grid. Uh, yeah, six panel grid. Sometimes they would do nine panel grids. Um, this is very popular in the beginning of sort of the Marvel and DC comics. So every panel is exactly the same size. And you would have, sometimes you would have, you know, here a, a close up of a person talking and then people running and then maybe a, a you know, a, a punch, big, you know, fight scene and then an explosion. But when every panel is exactly the same size, it doesn't emphasize that any one is more important than any other. Where that's what we want to do here. So the anchor panel is probably is usually the one that has the most action or it's the most exciting or the most visually interesting. So one of these panels has a character that her powers are involved light. She lights up. She can sort of make laser blasts and that kind of stuff. So her powering up and glowing and her powers coming on and her and she can fly. So her raising up into the air, that to me is, is the most important panel of the whole thing. And that's, so I've identified that's panel number three. So that one I want to have be really fairly good size. So if I want to do panel number three, fairly big, I might put that here. So it's taking up, you know, um, one, two, three. So a quarter of the page, maybe a pretty decent out of, out of seven panels, it's going to be much bigger. Maybe even bring it up a little bit here. So something like that. So that means if I have panel three, so I have to put one and two here. So I can do kind of split this in the middle if I want. Um, let's see. Number two is the panel where the character, before she lights up, she explains what she's going to do. That could be a close up of her face. So that one might be a little bit smaller. So I might go like this and then erase that. So I might kind of go one, cause it's going to have multiple characters in it. Speaking back and forth, that gives me room for dialogue bubbles and, uh, multiple figures close up so I can sort of do just do a circle to let them know this is and I'll need to make it a little smaller or a little off to the side for because she has dialogue bubble so do that and then big figure here and she's rising up in the air so kind of just do a flying figure you know just a shape just so I kind of know what I'm what I'm working on here. <clears throat> Number one is going to be this guy's. And then this guy's, the guy he's talking to is going to be in the foreground. So he's like, first up is this guy over here, right? And he goes, yep, that's me. And then we'll have the girl who's lighting up over here. She's a little bit shorter. A couple other figures around. And then, so that's one, two, three. Then I've got four, five, six, and seven. So seven is pretty important and has a very, again, you can't see it, but it, it does have a horizontal action element to it. So I'll probably put, so put that, and then I have that going this way. So this is page number nine. So as you look at a comic book, um, which I have here, this is a trade paperback of a comic. So you have page one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is nine. So at, this is, this is what I'm doing is page nine. So it's going to be here. So this action is going to take you to the flip. So it's going to take you to where, boom, now you're going to flip. And page 10 is going to be um, a big splash page. So that works perfect to have 
that action and that motion going in that direction on a nice wide at the bottom because we read like a Z pretty much. So having everything at the end come to this, the act, everything directing you, all the art and the words and everything to this corner at the end is, is your goal. That's what we want to do so that the person knows this is the end of this page. I want to flip it and boom, we're going to have a big splash page. So that means I have to do four or five and six in here. So, um, that means I've, you know, I've got what I've got. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to fit in, f you know, four, f five, six, and then seven. So for me, that, that works. I've got a big shot, fairly good size here, sort of showing the background. <coughs> I have a close up, so I've gone from a wide shot with lots of people to a close up to a full body shot. Again, that anchor page, very exciting. She, I may have her break the panel here, here, you know, something like that. Lighting up with energy and stuff like that, and then it's going to go to it goes from here to here, and he's pointing, so he's going to be pointing down, which will take you to this one which takes you here and then down and then through. So that's kind of the stuff that I'm looking at as far as how I put a page together. Now, some people do all this work um, on other pieces of paper first. They'll do it on, um, you know, eight and a half by 11. So some people take that, that regular piece of, you know, copy paper, printer paper, eight and a half by 11, fold it in half, and do little, they call them thumbnails, right? So they'll draw real small. Some, some will even go half of that and draw even smaller. And so then they take those little thumbnails and they'll work up several ideas. And then you can blow them up on your printer and then you can trace them onto the board and then do all your, your work. Nothing wrong with doing it that way. That's one way that I know that, uh, some professionals who, who do it. For me, it's just as fast for me to work it out on the big page. And then I also get to really see how the details are going to work and how big it is. So this page at 11, uh, 11 by 17 is going to be reduced down until it is comic book size. So that tells me if I do a panel that's, you know, this big, so one inch by one inch, it's going to be really, really small. So again, for me, it's just, I find it just as easy to work through, um, to work through on the board. Again, it also helps that I'm inking myself. Um, if I was going to do the pencils and give it to another inker, then I could see I might want something cleaner. So I might do all this kind of work and I might figure out all the shading and, and all that kind of stuff ahead of time on something and then use a light box to trace it or a blue line, uh, print it in a very faint blue color and drew a much cleaner version of, of the pencils so that an inker could ink it later. All that stuff are all different devices and, and ways that work. There's no, um, Spam. Um, there's no wrong way to to lay out your page. Everything works. It's all good. It's just a question of what works best for you. Um, and in this case, like I said, working directly on the page is what works for me. So the next step is to um, line uh, line out these borders of the panels so that I know that they're straight and even. Um, and that's where I, I use a ruler to do that. So what I will do here is I've roughed about kind of where I want it. So what I'll do is I'll measure from one edge and I know that this is basically three and three quarter inches. So if I mark that at three and three quarter inches, and then what I'll do is, um, I like to do, I guess it's uh, sixteenths. So right to two, two sixteenths, one eighth 
inch border. So I would do this and this on either side of that. And then that's my border. So again, I'm going to go three and three quarter, which is actually here. And then a 16th on either side. And then theoretically this now makes that nice and straight. And my panel border when I ink it will be the same width. Now, this is just something that I developed for me. I have never heard anybody tell me what width this panel border has to be. In fact, some people don't use panel borders at all. They just draw a line or, you know, there's no, this is called a gutter because there's a space in between. It could be white. You could cover it in a color, um, but, uh, it is a staple of comics to separate those panels out. It's a little old school. I like it. And again, I've never had anybody tell me, don't put the panel borders in or your panel borders are too large or whatever. That's just how I do it. So that being said, um, I'm going to do the same thing over here. So measuring from one side where you've got these lines on the page really help you out. Some some of the pages that you can get are pre-measured. They'll actually have measurements on the side. That makes this even easier. Um, it just happens to be that these pages that I got um, are not pre-measured. And, and that's okay because then I can, you know, I can do, obviously do it myself here. So we go to six and a half is about right there. And uh, then again, I'll go an eighth. So same thing, six and a half, eighth there. And let's see, and then the same kind of thing. So as I come across here, um, this one is five and an eighth. And then again, I'll do um, an eighth on either side or 16th on either side, so five and an eighth. And then there and there. And it's just, it just helps keep everything straight, even. I, I've actually seen artists, I saw uh, Jim Lee one time on his Twitch stream he was working on a super van page and um, he was trying the panel borders and I don't even know, he used a straight edge, but he was like, I don't, he's like, I don't measure. I don't know if it's the, the line is straight, but he's like, I don't know if it's the same height. If it's, is it slightly crooked? He goes, he's like, I just eyeball it and, and close enough. And I was like, wow. Okay. So, but that's, you know, somebody who's been doing it, you know, for many, many, many years and uh, nobody's about to tell him that he's doing it wrong. So that's how he does it. So that's what I'm saying. Like there's no, there's no rhyme or reason or um, rules that I'm aware of in regards to panel border. So if you want to make yours an eighth of an inch thick uh, like this 16th, 32nd, just remember everything's going to shrink. So, if your panel border, like if, if this is an eighth of an inch, it's going to be reduced by more than 50% or no, it prints at 67%. So it's going to be reduced by, I guess, 33%. So, so a third of this will be gone, right? It'll shrink by a third. So that's pretty, um, you know, it's a fairly significant amount. So you don't want to make lines that are, too thin or you'll never, you know, they'll disappear. You'll never see them. So it's and the other thing you can do is, um, you know, there are obviously other ways to do this. So I'm doing it all measuring it to make sure, um, T squares, 
great tools, great drafting tools. Highly recommend. Get yourself a clear T-square. I could. Uh, I know I've got a straight line here. I could just line this up and just randomly put it and eyeball it if I didn't want the borders to be consistent. Um, but, you know, like I said, for me, um, I, I prefer the consistency where my panel borders are the same. Unless um, it's part of the storytelling. So there are certainly instances where you might want a panel border to be um, to be ragged looking or to be um, a, a shape or the shape of a letter or the shape of an explosion or you know whatever. It doesn't have to be a perfectly straight square line. Um, you can you know, make it whatever you want. I will say this as I'm, I'm working through my, um, my various projects. So I have this project that we're working on called the just, which has book one is completely drawn. Um, and, uh, we've got some color samples, so we're getting ready to, um, to get ready to launch a crowdfunding campaign for the just for book one, as I work on book two, um, my personal book M squad is, um, being lettered. And one of the things in that is, um, the letterer is prepping the pages to be printed and he's got to make sure that they're all square. So you don't want to send one to the printer and have it slightly off register and off kilter so that when it's printed, it doesn't print square on the page. So having lines that you know are square to, uh, the borders of the page, really makes a big difference because there's nothing that says that this, this actual paper is cut straight, but if it's all relative, if it's all square to itself, then you know, it's going to make it a lot easier for that pre-production work, um, to get done. So that is, is how I would start out in laying out a page. Um, and then depending on how you want to work, some people, and actually, so, so some people will work from top to bottom, start at the top left, work to bottom, right. I have done that. I've done that for years. And part of that is about keeping it consistent, um, with lighting, with costume design, with angles, all that kind of stuff. It can make a, a difference. I've also recently started to get to a point of like, okay, what can I get through maybe a little faster? What panels can I uh, uh, get through? And maybe they have less background or detail or whatever. So I have been sort of jumping around a little bit um, more recently. So as I look at this, this panel up here with multiple figures and stuff is going to take me longer. I'm going to have to reference an earlier page of the book to see kind of where people are standing and um, make sure I have, again, all the details right that I want to have for people in the background. This one, I don't need any reference. I know what this character looks like. It would be fairly easy for me to knock out a close-up headshot um, without having to do anything. So that, that would be where I would start. And for me, I do, um, so I, I work, um, I work on my table and I do move the, the page around a lot so that I don't have to stretch and reach so far to make it, you know, where it's comfortable. So if I'm going to work on the top, I'll move it down a little bit. I'll move the camera in so you can see. Um, but I also work with my table fairly upright. It's, it's a little more tilted than it normally would be right now. Um, because it helps with the camera angle, but I work with it almost horizontal. Uh, I'm sorry, almost vertical. I know some people work very horizontal and then they can just sort of lay the page down. They don't have to tape it and stuff like that. I work straight up. Um, my problem is, has always been that if I work like this at an angle, so you can really see it, see how in the camera, it looks like this end of the paper is so much smaller than this end. And as I'm drawing, I find it skews the perspective. If I draw it, at too much of a, of a horizontal. So when I was in college, um, my, one of my art teachers had us work 
and we actually put our paper up on a wall. So we would uh, put the paper up on the wall and work completely vertical. And um, it was an exercise that really helped me to understand, you know, how I was skewing my drawing so that the, the top part, you know, was, was a different size. And, and I'm like, why is the, you know, why is the head so big? Um, and the feet are so small. And it was because I was working on large paper at such an angle that if I make it look the same size and you put it down normally, all of a sudden it's skewed. So anyway, just to, to share, I work, it's also much better for my back. Um, you know, it's over the years, I, as I've gotten older, I have found that, um, I, I do have some problems with my, with my lower back. And, um, as far as working, if I'm very hunched over, um, sometimes when I do like sketch covers, um, I can show you, I did a, um, I did a, a sketch cover recently, this red Sony sketch cover. So I don't want to tape the comic book to the to my drafting table. So I will work on my, at my computer desk and work very flat, kind of hunched over. And, um, after doing something like that for a little while, uh, my back and my shoulders get very, very tight. So working, um, in a vertical, you know, presence where my table is, is upright for me, um, helps out a lot and hopefully will, you know, help, um, uh, the longevity of, of, you know, being able, being able to draw. Um, I think uh, as with probably most artists, um, one of my, <laughs> one of my greatest fears are things like, uh, carpal tunnel, um, uh, poor vision, you know, your vision starting to go and, um, and things like your back, um, because it's, it is taxing on your body to sit, in this position, you know, with your arms stretched out and, and all that for, you know, time after time, you know, for, for hour after hour. So, so now I'm just sort of starting to rough in the shapes of this character. She's got, uh, hair that comes up. So she's got a costume that sort of comes partially over her, her forehead and then down on the sides of her, her head and face. And then, uh, she's, she's very nice. And she's going to have a very calm and, um, you know, expression. She's, uh, they're going to work, her and this other person are going to work together, um, to see what kind of powers this other person has. And so, um, uh, she's, you know, going to put them at ease. This is, it's no big deal. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. So I want to have a very, like I said, a very mild expression on her face. Um, and then she's got a, a bunch of hair that swoops down out of the, out of the mask or to the side. Uh, okay. So super rough, lots of lines there. Um, I would erase off some of this and then clean it up before I went to ink it. Um, but before I get there, um, again, not the most exciting thing in the world, but I am going to actually ink in the, um, the panel borders that I did. And, and the reason is as I work on this, figure, right? So I want to erase some of these, um, the underdrawing that I've done, um, to make it easier to see what lines I want to keep and then tighten it up. If I go in with my eraser, if I'm not careful, I'll, I can erase the, the, um, the panel border, which I don't want to do. So now because they're all measured, I don't have to use the ruler. I know that they're all the way they are. So now I can use my T square and just make sure that they are straight lines. Um, and then for this, uh, again, it's personal preference. So at the very beginning, as I started working, I, um, I started using these 
Faber Castell pit pens. Um, I've been using them for some time. I like, I, I like them. Um, I don't use them as much as I used to. Um, but I started using this one, which is the F for, I guess, for fine. There's um, small, extra small. So this is sort of a medium. And I'm sure there are other um, pens, uh, Micron pens, Copic pens that would um, line up with this F, whatever F for fine is. But this is the pen that I started using to rule out my panel borders. So it's, it's dark. It's, but it's not huge. It's um, thicker than the finest line work that I'm going to do, but it's not as thick as some of the heavier outlines that I'm going to do. So it's a nice medium in between line that helps separate this as a piano border versus um, the actual line work inside. So that is why I use that pen. But again, there are no hard and fast rules about the width of the line on your panel borders. I think it can be whatever you want it to be. I'm sure back in the day, there were rules about it. But um, for now, I'm not aware of any. And so much of this is because of modern technology. You know, I think I, I may have mentioned some of this in... Oops, have to fix that after that happens more often than I would like it, but that's what things like whiteout are for. Uh, so anyway, I was saying um, in the old days of printing, when comics sort of came from newspaper strips and uh, things were in the early days of printing, you had to have plates made to, to print stuff. Um, the printing process required a very deliberate black and white line work for stuff. Um, as opposed to today with computers and scanning, you can definitely play around and still print, you know, exactly what you see on the page. So, we don't necessarily need, um, you don't even need to really ink comic book pages anymore necessarily. Um, if your, you know, your pencils are dark enough, you can use the computer to, um, to render them, you know, to adjust it, the, the, the contrast and, you know, people have done it where they've printed, uh, straight from the pencils and, and use computer coloring over it and, all that kind of stuff, but it's part of the tradition. It's part of what makes the comic book medium different than say just traditional illustration work. Um, or, you know, even, um, other forms of cartooning. It really does this, this black line work that, um, that delineates between panels, between images, between colors, all that kind of stuff, again, it's just, it's a truly unique element to, to the art form. And it's what says comics. You know, if you, if you see another, another form of entertainment that has that line quality of, you know, black, a heavy black line and then colors inside, everybody refers to it as comic book. And that's a comic book style or, you know, I like the comic book the art in this or, you know, whatever. So, um, as I ramble, but, uh, so much of, of what we do and the reasons why we do it are part of history of the history of comics, of the history of the medium. And, um, you know, that's why it's important to study that, to study the history, to study, um, what, uh, you know, what came before. So you know why, and you can use it to your advantage. So I have left this line and this line here blank in case I wanted to break the panel a little bit. I certainly here, uh, with her foot, I may decide to break the panel. Um, if I want to break the panel, maybe with her hand or something, I'll just wipe that out. 
um, and fix it. And I can either do it, I like to do it on the page so that the page is reflective of what ends up getting printed, but you can certainly do it when you scan the black and white art, you can do it in the computer as well. So now um, I've got some of this done. Like I said, I'm gonna take this, uh, I've shown you this before, this is the kneaded art eraser. Um, it's a way to pull up some of the lines without pulling up all of the lines. Um, if you don't like what's going on and you completely want to start over, then you use one of these more heavy rubber erasers. And again, I recommend the white eraser, not uh, you know your traditional school pink eraser. The pink coloring can be left behind on the page sometimes. So um, always get a white one. And then as far as this goes, because um, I don't, I, I don't want to erase every line. I just want to erase the lighter lines, those underlying pieces, uh, 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 construction lines. So we're going to kind of do that. So now it's not quite so messy. I'm not dragging my hand through it quite so much. And then I can go ahead and start um, tightening this up. So um, I want to start. And this character is... Um, I believe she, yeah she is of asian descent and so um, i'm going to give her um more of an uh, an asian eye i think that's at least that's my my version some people might be going that just looks like an eye Usually, um, yeah. Now, and again, none of these lines that I'm drawing right now are final. This is the penciling stage and I'm going to ink over this. So if I decide in the middle of the inking process, um, I really don't like, you know, the, I don't like the shadow on the nose. I, I want it different then um, I change it and I can do it right on the fly as I'm, I'm inking. If I was going to send this to someone else to ink, I would definitely be more conscientious about putting the lines exactly where I want them so that anything that I think is critical is not missed. And, and, you know, so an inker is still going to bring their own take on it. They're going to see something and go, Oh, that there should be a little shadow there, or I'm going to add, I'm going to add some, some lines here, some, you know, some shading on, you know, whatever in her hair or on her lips or, or whatever. And that part, you know, that's what working with a partner in terms of an, another artist, that's where the inker and the penciler together is better than just the penciler or just the inker by themselves, right? The sum of the parts is greater. Is that what it is? Is that the same? Um, so, but because I'm doing it myself, well, so I, again, I don't want to, I don't want to miss things. I don't, I wouldn't want an anchor to have to guess at what I was looking for. Like, is this a shadow or is this, you know, are these lines part of her costume? Like what, you know, what is this? So, um, I wouldn't want that to happen. So I would be very clear about what's what basically that's the that's the goal as a penciler in my mind is to lay down the lines as clearly and concisely as you can if you're working with an anchor for you know for that anchor so that they um don't have to guess and they can then without having to worry about what is this what is that they can bring their own artistry to the partnership and, and bring in something really cool. 
when I'm working on my own, it I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to sit there and go, oh, that's what is that shadow? Oh, I you know, I know what that shadow is and I can extrapolate and expand on it and change it in the inks and if I if I don't again, I don't like the a line that I did in the hair, I don't have to keep that line. I can fix it in inks. So that is one of the the beauties of inking yourself if you're like me and you do have a little bit of a a control <laughs> a control freak living inside. Uh, which at times I do, um, then I don't have to worry about it. So uh, so yeah, so there is a a close up you know of the character. She's going to be responding and talking about what's going on. Um, one of the things for me um, now, there is so there's dialogue. So I know that part of this drawing is going to have to be covered up with dialogue. Probably right here. Right? There's going to be lines of dialogue, maybe a little here. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay. I draw knowing that some of my art is going to be covered up, and I am okay with that. Um, sometimes you may not want that as an artist. You're, you know, some people um, would be very upset if some of their art was covered up. I'm good because I know it's going to happen on the flip side of that. If I wanted to, one of the things I could do because the, my, my writer has given me some of the, um, the uh, dialogue. Like I know there's a line of dialogue here. I could give myself sort of a word balloon and then draw around that word balloon. Make sure, yeah, I'm on camera. So that I know that it would fit. But again, I don't want to, I don't want to shortchange or assume, because I'm not a letter, where they're going to put the letters, where it's going to go, how many, how much space they need. So I, again, just draw and if it gets covered, it gets covered. That is okay with me. I, I don't mind. And I've explained that to letters that I've worked with in the past. Don't worry about it. Put the di the dialogue is important. Put the dialogue in, cover up whatever you've got to cover up. I'm okay. Um, but something to think about. Again, another thing as an artist, as a penciler that you have to take into consideration is if you know that this character has got, you know, 20 lines of dialogue to get through the, in this panel, it's not going to work in a panel that size. They're going to need a bigger panel for that kind of dialogue. So you can kind of um, compensate. Same thing, like how, how much, you know, how tightly are you working with your writer? So in my case, the writer, my partner, he writes, but any of this dialogue can be changed. He's just giving me hints or clues, kind of a general direction of where the dialogue is going so that I know for facial expressions, um, I know for body language and telling the story kind of what they're going to be saying. But if I give him less room, he'll pare the dialogue down. If I give him a panel with a lot of room, he might use that opportunity to fill it up with some more dialogue. So these are all things that come into it and, and are other things that you have to think about and work through and talk about um, as you are, um, as you're working through a page. So if I wanted to from here, I could go ahead and pencil the rest. Now, again, one of the things that I have, and you can maybe see, and it's, I mean, it doesn't matter if I was right-handed, if I was drawing over here, I'd still be dragging my hand across being a lefty for whatever reason I tend to I maybe mean, it's just the way I work. I do tend to smear across the page a lot. So for me, the quicker I can clean up the pencils and be done with the pencil part, the cleaner the overall page is going to be. Now there are ways around it. There are gloves you can get that have, that just covered like these fingers and leave 
you know, these up, uh, open for your um, for your fingers. I've seen inkers use those little gloves a lot. Um, I've heard about people putting, you know, another piece of paper here. I've heard somebody um, said a comic book with a glossy cover. They put that over their hand and that doesn't smudge. Whatever works for you. For me, I tend to just ink as I go. So as I'm going to finish this panel, I'm just going to ink the panel and I'm going to erase it. And then I don't have to worry about it later as I'm working over here, as I'm working down here, whatever. It's good. It's done. That's just me. Um, also, for the purpose of this video, I'll now talk about the inking process again. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen one of my earlier videos, and we'll go through that whole thing. So I'll at least finish a panel um, in this video, and then we can go into some more. So this is a uh, Micron. It's a zero one. It is one of the smaller tip Micron uh, pens. Again, there's no limit to the number of pens and things that you can get. I've got um, these Faber-Castell pens. So I have small, which I think is fairly close in size. Um, so I could use this. Uh, they have extra small. I have this is just called an Artist Loft illustration pen. I've use that. It's about the same size. Um, you name it. There are no limit to the different kinds of pens. These for me tend to work well. I like the line weight. I like the size. They're also fairly inexpensive. So as I go through them and I ruin the tips because I tend to press harder than I probably need to as I ink to get a nice steady line, um, the little um, felt tip of the pen will eventually end up being bent and it's no good, but these aren't particularly expensive pens either. So, uh, it's not a big deal. So you can get them in packs and kind of burn through them and you don't feel bad about breaking an expensive pen. Now this is for me because I ink with pens. There are uh, many, 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 many professionals. Um, and again, as you're studying the history of comics, the further you go back, you'll find this much more common than today. People used brushes. People use brushes to ink every single line in every comic book, whether it is the face of the thing or it is the, the buildings in Gotham City and Batman. People used brushes for everything. So they would take their... They'd take their straight edge, they'd take their brush and, and make nice straight lines. Those people are incredible to me. If you can ink uh, with a brush, man, more power to you. That said, more and more professional inkers. Well, so, so that was the way it was for a long, long time. And then I think I'm going to say somewhere between the maybe the 70s and 80s, um, there were a couple of inkers that sort of broke the mold and started doing things a little differently. And they started using, um, uh, what well, I guess I, we call them dip pens. So sort of the, right, it's just a pen with a nib on the metal nib on the end. And you dip it into ink, a bottle of ink, and that gives you your line. And that gives you a really, uh, tight, um, clean, crisp ink line. Um, and because the, the way that it works, the, the nib, it flexes. So it's built like this. It has ink in it. And as you draw a line, it has this nice line like this. As you press down, it spreads and it makes a bigger, wider line. So you can make your line go thin, thick as needed. With these, you can't do that. Um, these don't have that kind of flexibility. So this gives you one consistent, solid line weight throughout everything. So if I want to vary up the line weight to kind of um, imitate that, uh, that look of thick, thin, like they got with brushes, like they got with nibs, um, I actually have to go back in with different size brushes or different size pens and build up those lines separately that way. So anyway, so um, I have found, though, more and more professional inkers, even though they might have been, um, you know, the kind of people that used the pen and nib 
style inking um, throughout their career, as they go forward with today's pens, there's such variety. The ink quality is very good. Um, they don't, the ink doesn't fade. That was always one of the problems with markers or pens in the old days is you put the ink down and, you know, when no time it turned purple or it turned brown or whatever, it would fade. These pens have archival India ink in them. So they, the, the ink will stay nice and dark and black. And when you scan it, um, it is very minimal. The, um, the settings and sort of the, the printer or the scanner settings I have to do to get it to be completely opaque black, very, very minimal because the ink is really good. So more and more people, professionals are going to pens and such these days, just because it's easier, it's faster, it's cheaper. I mean, so you can, you know, if I really push down or if I, if I really scribbled a lot of ink on this and, and pushed it, I could smear this if I'm not too careful, but for the most part, it's no big deal. I'm, I can ink over this as much as I want pretty much. And I'm not going to worry about smudging it or smearing it or having to wait for it to dry or anything like that. Um, not like you would have to do if you were using, you know, one of those older, um, solutions, be it brush ink or, or nib pen, dip pen, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, those you've got to worry about, um, the ink drying and, or spilling, or, <laughs> uh, you go to, you go to use the, I've, I've used some of the nib. I'm not, I, great at it, but I, I do know how to do it. And, um, you know, if you're not careful, you go and it can spatter. Um, it can, um, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses basically to everything. So these pens give you what's referred to as a deadline. The line is the same weight all the way across. There's no variety to it. There's no life or bounce to the line. But man, it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot faster, it's a lot easier. And then you can sort of doctor up the ink line as you need it um, to be a little lively or a little more bouncy. So again, it, everything has its, its pluses and its minuses. And you just have to find what works best for you. So again, now, I, I've just finished inking this. Um, I don't... You know, I'm not going to be pressing really hard with this eraser. You don't need to, but I'm able to pull up this ink or the, the pencil, excuse me, underneath the ink. And I don't have to really worry about, is it going to, you know, am I going to, um, uh, smudge it, smear it. It dries almost instantly. As soon as you draw on the page, it's a pen. So, and then as well, you want to travel with them. You don't have to travel with little bottles of ink and you don't have to worry about cleaning them after, you know, uh, like you do with brushes or nibs. So all in all, pretty good. Um, so now um, I'm going to go in. These are called, they're, they're considered brush pens. So this is a zebra pen um, and it has a flexible felt tip to it. So you can you can push down on it and get a slightly wider line or, or tighter line. I like to use it to fill in some of the, um, the darker areas, um, because it, it is a little bit wider. So you can get more in one pass. And there's not a lot of large, um, black shadows in this particular drawing. If there are, I have um, other pens that are built kind of like a, uh, as brushes. They've got you know, a little nylon actual brush and there's ink in the handle. That would be if I had a large, you know, area If the costume was all black, you know, again, like if I was going to draw, you know, Batman or um, uh, what's this, uh, Zorro. Uh, characters that are, you know, all in black, um, maybe uh, Black Widow. Um, 
I would use those larger brush pens to cover more area. Here, I just want to get some of the um, larger areas. Now this, I do need to be careful with, I want to make sure I don't smudge that because it can, um, it can smudge if you're not careful. Okay, her eyes, inside of the mouth. Um, I'm going to leave her eyebrows, actually. And then, um, I'm going to, this is, I'm going to, so the hair, this hair being in front of her face, I want to have a slightly thicker outline to help uh, pu pull it forward or push um, her face back behind it. Same thing here. This is in front of the hair in the back. So I'm going to do that. And then um, this is just me. So I... Um, I like to say it's a style, my inking style. I don't know if it truly is a style or just the way I've done it, but um, I tend to outline all of my figures um, fairly heavily. And again, just to pop them off the, the page um, to separate them from the background, even though there is no there's no background drawn behind her. There certainly will be some sort of a, a color fill and as I mentioned, dialogue boxes and stuff like that. So what I tend to do is the closer something is, the larger the outline is around it. Um, the further something is in the distance, the thinner the lines get, the more faint um, the outline gets. And it's a way of just creating... Um, a, you know, fake sense of depth, um, with, you know, my, my elements, my foreground, middle ground, background elements. So basically here there's, there's no, there is no foreground, middle ground, background. Everything is sort of all in one plane. I guess you could say, you know, like this part of the hair is in front of this. So I guess you could say it's, foreground, middle ground, background, sort of. Uh, but anyway, this is, you know, just how I do it. And again, it's just the thing that I've developed from necessity. I don't know if it's, if you would call it right or wrong as far as inking goes in terms of the, the art of inking. You know, I'm sure there are, I think I say this every time I have a video where I I do some inking there. There are inkers who would see this and would, you know, uh, curse my name for doing it. So, so wrong, so badly, whatever. But this is just, like I said, it's, it's what works for me. And it's something that I've worked to sort of in inevitably become what I consider to be my inking style. And, um, and I do like it and, and it works and I've not had complaints from publishers. So I guess it, it must work for them too. Um, I do know that I've, you know, I have heard from colorists and they've said it's, you know, my, the art is very clear. It's, it's obvious what's, you know, what's what things are separated pretty well. So I guess that must mean something. Okay, so there we go. So that is a simple uh, panel inked, done. And so now I'm going to keep going. So next I might do this one. Again, it's just a figure. He's pointing his fingers at, at what eventually is, is her. So I might go down and ink these here. Probably finish with that last because it is the most complicated uh, panel. And then you're done and then scan it and that is it. So that's the process of from script 
um, and breaking it down into how many panels I need. I showed you how I work out on the page how those panels need to go. And again, not necessarily built from left to right, but you know, I started with what's the biggest splash page, what's the, the anchor point, the most important panel on the page, and kind of build it out from there. So, you know, built here, need to have an establishing setting of what's happening. Here's some dialogue, just dialogue can be a close up of that person. And you want to vary. So you want to have something that's a far medium shot, a close up, a full figure, again, more of a medium, a slightly bigger, even bigger, and then here. So you want to just vary it all up, make sure you're moving the camera around as much as you can to make it interesting. And that's how you lay out a page. I hope it's been very helpful. I hope it's been interesting and educational. I appreciate you so much for checking out the video. Thank you. Thank you. Please make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Um, I can't believe how many new folks have been subscribing lately. I am overjoyed with how many of you have come on and the comments that I get. Thank you so much. Um, again, keep looking. I'm going to have more um, updates as we get closer and closer to when my new books are coming out. And um, I'll start to do some videos about those and the campaigns and, and how that is going as soon as I can. In the meantime, I'm going to keep working on uh, pages. Uh, keep drawing if you're an artist. Keep writing if you're a writer. Keep creating if you're a creator. Stay safe and uh, look for another video soon. Thanks.